Welcome to today's webinar, The Truth About Marijuana. We're so glad you could join us. My name is Amy Gall, the Director of Education for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey. The partnership is providing today's webinar. A few pieces of information before we get started. An hour after the webinar ends, you will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. We ask that everybody complete the survey to provide us with feedback on the program. If you would like to receive a certificate of completion, you must listen to the entire webinar and complete the evaluation survey. Certificates of completion will be sent via email within one week of the broadcast. This program is being recorded and will be available on the partnership's YouTube channel. We will be muting all attendees' microphones during this presentation, but we would love to hear from you. So please feel free to write questions in the question box, and at the end of our program, the speaker will respond to as many as possible. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Yazelle Alawi. Giselle has worked in the field of addictions for over 20 years. She received her BA in psychology from the College of St. Elizabeth in Morristown, New Jersey, and her MA in counseling from New Jersey City University in Jersey City. Giselle is a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor and an international certified alcohol and drug counselor fetal alcohol spectrum disorder certified educator and TIPS certified trainer. For the past 14 years, she has been a perinatal addictions prevention specialist. Giselle currently serves as the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey's Community Education Coordinator for the Perinatal Addictions Prevention Project. A member of multiple advisory committees in Bergen, Essex, and Passaic counties, as well as the New Jersey Task Force on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, Giselle is a popular professional and consumer educator in northern New Jersey. Her achievements have been recognized by the Bergen County Sheriff's Department, County Board of Chosen Freeholders, and County Clerk. Welcome, Giselle. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for the lovely uh, presentation uh, that, that you did about me. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has joined joining this webinar this afternoon to learn more about the truth about marijuana. So let's get started. We are the Perinatal Addiction Prevention Project. Judy King is the manager of this project. Rachel Ugrunaski is our Perinatal Addiction Specialist, a Prevention Specialist. And I am the community education coordinator for this project. We serve eight counties in New Jersey, and we are generously funded by the New Jersey Department of Health. By the end of this presentation, all participants will have gained more knowledge of the various forms of cannabis, how it's being used, and the impact it may have in pregnancy. When it comes to disclosures, I have no conflict of interest to disclose at this time. Successful completion. In order to receive nursing contact at educational hours, the participant must attend the entire program and complete and submit a program evaluation. All, all certificates will be distributed electronically. This webinar will be available on the Partnerships YouTube channel until April 29 of 22. The objectives for today, we're going to describe marijuana and cannabis. We're going to define the effects of marijuana in the brain and body. We are going to identify all the forms of cannabis, recognize the use of medical marijuana, discuss the effect of marijuana on pregnancy, and review treatment modalities available with someone with cannabis use disorders. Marijuana comes from the Indian hemp plant. It is, it is believed to have been originated from Central Asia. This plant has been used for 12,000 years. It's one of the oldest 
cultivated plants consumed by humans. Cannabis is primarily from the flower buds with less in the seeds, stem and leaves. Marijuana can be sold as a mixture of all three. Most of us are familiar with the term marijuana, but technically we are talking about a cannabis plant. This plant has been called by other slang names, such as weed, Mary Jane, Gansha, Dona Juana, 420, Aches, Blunt, the list is endless. When studying about the topic of marijuana, I came across of more than 100 names for this plant. And the reality is, is we need as clinicians or nurses to be aware of these slang terms, especially when we're screening our young people. We want to make sure we are tapping into the right uh, terminology because they might not see it as, as marijuana if we ask them. They might see it as ganja. So just keep that in mind. When we talk about marijuana, that there's a myth that marijuana is harmless, there's a reason for that. When studying in the 19, 1980s, the THC concentration, which is the psychoactive substance that makes an individual high or if, if experience euphoria, we're talking about having less than 4% of THC concentration. However, today, those concentrations are 10 to 20%, and some even as hard as, as 30%, much, making it marijuana more stronger and more potent. Cannabis plants. There are three well-known cannabis plants. We're talking about cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. We're going to only focus on cannabis sativa. This plant was genetically modified across breed of various plants to get different strains with different potency. From these plants, we can get, we can get marijuana and hash, which both can be um, smoke. Hash oil concentrates also can be smoke. CBD oil, topical use for creams and lotions to help with pains and aches. Edibles is used for eating, cookies, soda, gummies, and candy. All of this comes from cannabis plant. We can also include industrial fiber, seed oil, and much more. Marijuana, unlike cigarettes, when you smoke marijuana, you inhale deeper and hold your breath longer, resulting in severe impact on the lungs and body. Today's marijuana has up to 500 chemicals, seven of which are known cannabinoids, with THC being the psychoactive one. These, can, these cannabinoids are the ones that get obviously an individual high. Four to five million people in the United States meet criteria for cannabis use disorders. Marijuana can be smoking a cigarette, it's called a joint, can be used as a dry pipe or a water pipe, they call it a bung, or add it to a cigar, which we, they call, call it a blunt. Mixed with the tobacco in a bowl of a pie is actually called mooking. Board of marijuana. Smoking one joint, one joint equals five cigarettes in regards to cancer-causing chemicals. Once you start using marijuana, it can be detected days after using and if you are a heavy user, marijuana may be detected for weeks in a person. So after smoking marijuana, a person may experience the following physical effects, rapid heart rate, disorientation, lack of physical coordination, unreal state of mind, depression, sleepiness, panic attacks, anxiety, psychosis, bronchitis, um, excuse me, um, cough and phlegm, deformed sperm. The studies also indicate that smoking marijuana can disrupt menstrual cycles and is responsible for possible sterility in both males and females. It also impairs driving. You are three to seven times more likely to have a car, car crash if you are high. From this um, slide, I want you guys to see, to pay attention. Um, the ones that I see most common with 
patients or you know students that I uh, sometimes I hear from schools a lot of the time teacher will report to me you know I see uh, the students are reporting experiencing a lot of panic attacks and having trouble uh, falling asleep and staying and staying asleep throughout the night lots of anxiety uh, but the panic attack seems to be one of the most um, one reported by students when it comes to mental consequences such as impaired intelligence, marijuana use can impact various regions of the brain, such as the hippocampus, which is responsible for creating memories, prefrontal lobes, for making good judgment and good decisions. We know adolescents are more vulnerable at this time since their brain continues to be developing and the use of marijuana can impair that brain, how it works, and it works much slower, decreasing the blood flow and building less connections necessary for a healthy brain to be fully developed. We use our brain to reason, to solve problems. An average intelligence IQ is of 100%. 100%. Research indicates marijuana use can lower an IQ by six to eight points. It began using before the age of 18. You can also experience paranoia. Again, we go out a lot to teach about marijuana to the schools, um, to students, and I think I try to always emphasize these slides uh, to them and, and let them know about the long-term consequences of using marijuana. We're going to talk, which, you know, since we are in the topic of the brain, I want you guys to know that we have our own natural cannabinoids that, you know, that attach themselves to the receptors of our brains and throughout our body. CP1 receptors found in the brain impact different the brain regions responsible for coordination, for movement, pain, emotions, mood, thinking, appetite, and memories. CB2 receptors found in the secondary organs, such as our immune system, pain management, neur neurons, and neural pathways. We also use lingot and enzymes that help produce more cannabinoids receptors in demand when we need them. In order to understand, excuse me, drink a little water. In order to understand how these receptors work, I'm really going to talk about the endocannabinoid system, which for short is ECS. These systems is found in all animals, um, except in insects, like we have our circulatory system, our, um, so this one of the systems that we have, and the goal of this system is to help balance our body. So when we smoke marijuana, the THC cannabinoids serves as an analog, and too much of it disrupts our own natural cannabinoid process. So that in cannabinoid system is rid of all this excess in order to maintain a balance. It minimizes both pain and damage caused by marijuana. Lastly, the CBD oil seems to influence the body to produce more of its own cannabinoids. If you wanted to learn a little bit more about um, understanding how the cannabinoid system works, I highly recommend a tech talk by Dr. Rachel Knox from Portland. Lastly, when we talk about cannabis addiction, research says that one out of six adolescents who use this marijuana will develop an addiction. Today, half of those individuals are in treatment and they all are under the age of 25. More adults are becoming dependent than in the past and the reasons are, again, they start at a younger age, either by smoking or eating edibles. Um, remember today's marijuana is higher in potency and it's been sold everywhere, including online. In order to receive a cannabis use disorder or diagnosis, according to DSM-5, which is the Dynastic Manual for Mental Health Disorders, one has to have at least three symptoms of the following. I will highlight for you only three. Tolerance, needing more to get the same high. Persisting desire to use, and trouble controlling its use. And then I will focus on the last one. It says using marijuana um, despite being aware or experience persistent or re 
repeat a physical or psychological problem. An example here is unable to stop smoking marijuana while you're pregnant, when knowing that marijuana can harm the developing baby. Another example is self-medicating to release symptoms of depression and anxiety, making those psychological symptoms even worse. A word of caution, marijuana is still illegal under federal law, but 30 states and DC legalize medical marijuana purposes, including New Jersey. The legal use at the age of 25 for recreational use and in the District of Columbia, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and California. Notice New Jersey is not listed. Since the legalization of recreational use in California from 1992 to 2008, the number of admissions to substance use treatment centers has quintupled. They have definitely going up. Now we're moving into edibles. Edibles have been made with 95% of THC concentrates, making them more potent and dangerous to consume by anyone. Some edibles may also contain contaminants. In Colorado, now is the number one state for youth use of marijuana. Some stores are selling these as kid friendly edibles, such as gummies, candy, bars, lollipops, and soda. Since the legalization of Colorado, we have seen youth in probation testing positive for marijuana. Marijuana can be mixed with food, for instance, if you eat a piece of brownie, it may take a body to digest 30 to five minutes and to feel the euphoria that high that if you would smoke a joint. An individual often is more thinking, maybe it's not working. They might be feeling fine and consume more than intended to. The euphoria that high can last longer. The amount of marijuana in edibles can vary at this can be potentially dangerous if you don't know how much TAC may be in your brownie or an edible. Or let's say, for example, you are having, you know, I, you're eating brownies on a Sunday night and thinking, okay, I could go to work on Monday, I'm fine. You might not be, you might still be high going, going to work or to school. Edibles are sold without any specific regulation to follow. Uh, regulation they don't follow, even in the states with legalized recreational use. I hope we're doing okay, guys. <clears throat> Having more than intended brownies, edibles, to get high can lead to a psychotic episode, anxiety, anxiety attacks, paranoia, hallucinations. If children ingest, they can lead to respiratory insufficiency. And, you know, this is um, a reality I know um, as a result of somebody uh, experiencing cannab a cannabis overdose, they can actually show some symptoms that can include hallucinations and confusions, impaired ability to walk, impaired body movement, increased heart rate, extreme anxiety, or panicking, and this could lead to um, a visit to the ER or also to be calling um, poison control because a person needs immediate um, help. Now we're going to move to marijuana concentrates. They are considered the top shelf of marijuana in the streets. They're also known as THC extracts, like preferred in the streets like honey oil or butter, wax and shatter produces an intense high due to the higher concentration of TAC, approximately 40 to 80 percent, than traditional form of marijuana use. It can be used in pipes, vaporizers like electronic pens, bombs, and joints. A disturbing aspect about this emerging threat is the ingestion of concentrated via electronic cigarettes. Many smokers like to use it, electronic vaporizers because it's smokeless, odorless, and it's easy to hide and conceal. The user takes a small amount of marijuana concentrate, referred it as a dab, then heats up the substance using the electronic vaporizer, producing the paper that ensures an instant high for the user. This process is commonly referred as dabbing and vaping. 
some of the effects as, um, associated with this is an, um, lots of you know, relaxation, euphoria, laughter, increased appetite, heightened of the senses, altered time and perception. When a person crashes from this high, an individual may experience withdrawal symptoms like low appetite, irritability, anxiety, and muscle pain. Butane hash oil, highly concentrated THC with very little smell, known in the street as 710, which is the word oil flip backwards and sp spell backwards. Wax, earwax, honey oil, butane hash oil, BHO for a uh, in, in, in parentheses, chatters, dabs, dabbing, black glass, and herbs. One gram uh, of butane hash oil costs $50. One to two drops can equal a joint. And let's look, look at the concentration. It could be to 20 to 30 <clears> percent. Uh, this process is particularly dangerous because it's highly flame flammable um, butane uh, to extract the THC from the cannabinoid plants. And this process, the shreds or ground plant material is stuffed into a glass metal or a plastic pipe with a filter in one end, and the butane is forcing the open of the other end of the pipe. As butane goes through the pipe, the TAC with the plant material is extracted and forced through the filter, usually onto a, re a receptacle. The receptacle is the heated, heated is heated, right? So the THT, the THC extractions um, labs are being reported nation. I'm sorry, okay, I, I'm jumping to myself. So, so when this happens, sometimes it's so dangerous that sometimes it's mistaken for pipe bombs or, or med labs. Okay, so side effects can be longer than two hours, can cause psychosis, brain damage, and even death in individuals from exposures to high TAC. The crack of, a, of the path. Obviously in here we have higher risk of addiction. Okay, so we talked about that one. Now we're going to go on to medical marijuana. The medical use of marijuana, however, it was not meant to get an individual high. Medical marijuana comes in various forms, oil for vaporizers, pills, topical applications, oral solutions, and dry leaves and buds. But like other prescriptions, there's no instruction on how much and how often to use them. One thing we want to make sure we never smoke medical marijuana because again, it varies in strength contaminants and it may contain pesticides, heavy metals and fungus, right? So again, we know there's poor policing due to the quality of marijuana, right? We do know the uh, <clears throat> synthetic marijuana called mar Marinol has been used to treat patients with cancer, again, for chronic pain. And it does come in milligrams, as you can see here, 2.5 milligrams, five milligrams, right? And even taking this medication, it continues to provide side effects for the individual, such as lack of energy, anxiety, upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, racing heart, dizziness, facial flushing, sleepiness, confusion, hallucinations, and paranoia. <clears throat> CBD oils can be used in a vaporizer for inhalation. It gets faster to the bloodstream by bypassing the liver. A water caution when vaping is you know that when you inhale other chemicals from the electronic uh, device, right? So even though it's the most effective, but we're also inhaling other uh, contaminants from our, how we're we using this you know, with a vaporizer. Topical application, they come in creams, in lotions, salves, uh, soaps, and shampoos. And again, it's used for local pain relief for uh, body aches and uh, pain and aches. And it doesn't enter the bloodstream. Um, the CBD is derived by, it comes from the hemp plant, 
I mean, and in order, you know, it must contain less than 3% of THC in order to be legal under federal law to be consumed. And this is very important because you see that there's a big hype about the CBD oils in the stores, at the mall, everywhere. But the reality is we don't know how much of the TAC is in it. So, you know, it's important to keep an eye open in, on, the, on that. So if it's, you know, they might say, well, it's a CBD oil, but it has a TAC of, of um, instead of 0 0.3, it might be higher. So again, be careful with that. You wanna make sure, you know, you're not gonna get high if you use this, these products, right? It also comes, sorry, not, not the way around. It also comes as an oral form, in a sublingual, right? So you put it in the, under your tongue and it takes at least one minute and one minute and a half, minute, a minute and a half, and it's absorbed into the bloodstream. It bypasses the digestive system and the remainder of the pill, you can swallow it. CBD oil can also be put in foods, so you can ingest it. It passes through the digestive system and is metabolized by the liver. Typically, individuals like beginners and children, that's how typically they start using these edibles or the CBD oils um, this way. <clears throat> like I said before, there's a big hype about it, but remember, it's still being produced without any regulations. Esper reports very little scientific evidence regarding the medical benefits in how it can successfully treat um, conditions. Most studies are done on mice and rats. Only scientific studies that we really have is on the treating of epileptic seizures. The AA approved Epidolex CBD medication to treat two forms of childhood epilepsy. CBD oil is reported to treat the following, following although more research is needed seizures, anxiety, inflammation, sleeplessness, smoking cessation, avoiding or reducing withdrawal symptoms of substance use disorder, especially opiate abuse, neuropsychiatric disorders, schizophrenia, and cancer. Now we're gonna to move to synthetic marijuana. Synthetic mar marijuana is a herbal mixture that produces effects similar to marijuana. Some products are sold as incense, uh, but more like potpourri. And in the streets, they were known for spice, K2, fey weed, Bombay, Bombay blue, moon, moon rocks, lamba, bliss, scone, and genie. Again, this is usually also smoking joints, pipes, and electronic cigarettes. It, it can be also put in food and in tea. It can be mixed with marijuana or cocaine, heroin, metamphetamines are also well known for um, a mixture of this product with synthetic marijuana and fentanyl. There was a lot of deaths, uh, you know, that has been reported, I believe in, the, in, in New York City, because they found synthetic marijuana being laced from fentanyl. It can um, be prepared in herbal infusions for drinks. Pine chemicals, mostly found in spice, are designated as a class one control substance, making it illegal to sell, to buy, and possess. Manufacturers get around by just changing different chemicals. There's no studies for spice that fits on the brain. However, we do know that it does act on the same receptors as the THC, but much stronger. Some of the health effects are rapid heart rate, vomiting, agitation, confusion, hallucinations, anxiety, paranoia, elevated mood, out of perception, relaxation, delusions. Um, again, it seems one of the things we do in the partnerships to go out and educate, um, and teachers have informed me of um, students being found with this um, spice, synthetic marijuana in a spice too. And it's important to know that because, I mean, you don't, you know, you need to know what, what your student, your patient is using. And we do know that police have done a great amount of crackdown on bodegas in stores because, again, they think they're selling potpourri when in reality they, they're selling uh, synthetic marijuana. Now we're moving into cannabis um, and fertility. 
Some studies are indicating that using cannabis can impact the hormones necessary for a woman to get pregnant. It can also affect her menstrual cycles by disrupting it. In males, it can alter the sperm even before mating, increasing the risk of their offspring developing sperm's abnormalities associated with mood, learning, and reward. This is according to a recent study on rats by the New York Science News, and the name of the article is titled The Impact on Paternal Marijuana Exposure on the Brains of the Offsprings. When looking at the effects of cannabis use and pregnancy, there's no one single study that says, oh, it's okay to use marijuana during pregnancy. However, there are two studies here, one by JAMA, which is the Journal of American Medical Association, reported an increased use of pregnant women using cannabis from 2.4% from 2002 and 2014. ACO also reported an increase of 2.5% which echoes is the College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists. These studies are capturing lower socioeconomic women, um, 15 to 28% that are, are using. It is difficult to determine the effects of marijuana due to, due to many women are usually using multiple substances as alcohol, heroin, metamphetamines, barbiturates. Again, all this can impact the pregnancy. We, know, we do know that the use of, of, of cannabis decreases the blood supply to the baby. Women of every race and class uses drugs and alcohol during pregnancy and can result in a premature birth, in a lower birth weight, neurotoop defects, anemia, stillbirths, small head size, neonatal abstinence syndrome in some babies, sleeping difficulties, and again, maybe it can also be um, maybe something doesn't happen. Again, there's always a probability of a risk that there's a chance that nothing might happen, but typically this is what we see. THC exposure prenatally can affect um, the fetal growth, the structure and the function of those neurodevelopment. And this is important because when I was talking earlier about um, in the cannabinoid system, since the embryonic development um, there's not a single function in our bodies that is not being used or modulated by this uh, endocannabinoid system. So this is very important. Motor difficulties, disturbed sleep, aggression, fetal in the cannabinoid system, or again, no obvious negative impact. So it's always a risk. <clears throat> Edibles and CBD oils during pregnancy. Well, they're not safer than smoking marijuana for sure. It may be worse because you might have a, a, a higher levels of THC in an edible. If you don't know how much is in that little brownie, um, instead of having a little uh, piece of it, you might have the whole thing. So if you're pregnant, remember what mommy does, baby does. Both of these can pass to the baby in utero and can calm the developing of the fetus. The impact of children, children prenatally exposed may display poor executive functioning, memory problems, low verbal and reasoning scores, difficulty with attention, impulsivity, poor abstinence, reasoning, visual problems, solving dif difficulties. Mothers with cannabis use disorder can display um, problems such as, you know, problems with attention, judgment, coordinating and executive functioning. Um, depression, high risk behaviors as, as a result of, of their substance use, increased risk for psychiatric or comorbidity, can adversely affect the well being and development of children, can affect the child development and safety. And this is also true for all the other substances of abuse. Mm -hmm. Cannabis and breastfeeding, there's limiting conflict in studies on cannabis use and breastfeeding, for example. Some data indicates that if exposed in the first month of life um, of, of, the, of the infant, it can impair infant's motor development. The Academy of, of Breastfeeding recommends decreasing or stopping marijuana use. It can be found in the breast milk for days or weeks, depending on how much mom uses. The benefits of breastfeeding most likely outweigh the effects of marijuana exposure. 
So modern with cannabis use disorders may this, um, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, yeah, I, well, I already talked about that one. Now, this is a, an advice to mom avoiding smoking around the infant to eliminate exposure to secondhand smoke and avoid infants' contacts with clothes that might have cannabis residues on them. So this will be an advice to give mom. As we all know, most of us are uh, know that the most common substance found in drivers are to alcohol. Obviously, it's marijuana. Um, users are three to seven times more likely to have a car crash um, driving under the influence of marijuana associated with 110% increase in fatal crashes. In Colorado, Washington, and California, fatal crashes almost double after the legalization. And again, some of the reasons is because if we smoke marijuana, uh, we we slow our reaction time, it spares our coordination, it disturbs our perception. We might think it's a green light, but it's still in red. Impairs judgment, ability to make decisions, memory loss, um, difficulty with solving problem. It's unclear though if marijuana alone increases the car crashes because again, you know, most people are using it combined with alcohol. No accurate, we don't have at this time an accurate road test to be used to test for marijuana use. And marijuana again stays in the body for days or for weeks. <clears throat> More than money of marijuana and driving, we high levels of THC in the system. This is when three to times more likely to be responsible for a crash car, car crash. Um, many, many studies indicate that risk of being involved in a crash class significantly increases with marijuana use. Now we're going to talk about withdrawals. <clears throat> withdrawals begins one or two days after stopping. It should be resolved around the day 10 without, without with, withdrawals are uncomfortable, but they're not life-threatening. The FDA has not approved any medication for marijuana use disorders. A person going into uh, withdrawals can experience both uh, physical and psychological symptoms, and you can see them here, abdominal pain, sweatiness, chills, shakiness, fever, and headache. Psychological, irritability, anxiety, depressed mood, restless, changes in sleep, and eating. Right. So typically here, DTAS is not required for treatment. Um, however, many sub, you know, because of many substances of abuse, uh, an individual can be using. Uh, we can actually uh, marijuana can impair a person's daily functioning to the point that inpatient treatment can be uh, an option and it can be recommended. They will receive both psychological and medicational support. Also, it can be treated in an outpatient setting needing strong internal motivation to refrain from using. Lastly, again, self-help groups are also available and recommended. They have Narcotics Anonymous and Marijuana Anonymous as well. While the person is in treatment, um, they can re benefit from different therapeutic styles, from cognitive to behavioral therapy, motivation enhancement therapy, and family therapy. Again, we know addiction impacts the whole family system, so um, family therapy is, 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 is uh, greatly recommended for, for the whole family. Now, when it comes to prevention, how to prevent the use of marijuana among our adolescents? Well, research has demonstrated over and over the importance of having strong parent child bonding, preventing the ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, such as physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and poverty. When you have good family communication, you can co communicate clear rules about your expectation in regards to using alcohol, tobacco, marijuana during the teen years. Parents sometimes I find I uh, underestimate their power. You know, kids do listen. You know, providing structure, spiritual values, education about the facts of the risk associated with marijuana, not some scare tactics, keeping vigilant um, during the teen years. Remember, they still need us for guidance. Keep the young people busy in positive activities who will be less likely to engage in any self-harming ways um, such as consuming drugs and alcohol. Many parents sometimes I feel that, you know, when I go out and do my talks to early childhood development centers or, or at schools, you know, parents feel, well, my kids are already grown and they don't require too much supervision. No, they still need us. Uh, we know that the brain doesn't stop developing until the age of 25 and even older.
school. So, you know, the kids need us, uh, young people need us. For parents, teach some professional, please join your local prevention coalitions in your towns to learn more about how to prevent early substance use. Um, also have the young people be involved in their own towns and local prevention coalitions. Uh, what we have learned from the legalization of, of the legalization of recreational marijuana use is that it brings sense, it brings state revenue. Some people say it's debatable, increases diverse health effects in Colorado from marijuana intoxication, marijuana associated illnesses, and marijuana related burns occurring during the THC extraction of butane as a solvent. Majority of the emissions are related to the unintentional of, of ingestion of edibles or marijuana products among children. Many young people are being diagnosed with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. After using a cannabinoid, a person may experience the cycling vomiting syndrome that can last hours, days, and necessitates crampy abdominal pain. New Jersey medical marijuana condition has been approved to treat the following, and you guys have seen it in your screen. More on the approved conditions uh, we have on the second slide uh, for individuals to obviously can benefit. Okay, use disorder, locus, irritable bone syndrome, pancreatics, right, tourist syndrome, etc. In order to get medical marijuana, you need to, to, to get a recommendation from the doctor and, and then you will get a card with medical marijuana. Um, currently, there are about 500 doctors registered in the state of New Jersey, and there's about 70,000 New Jerseyans being, you know, using medical marijuana. In conclusion, although many states have legalized medical marijuana and several sta states have legalized for recreational use, anyone 21 and older. Marijuana, as you can see, is not a harmless drug. Although many states are now, you know, many studies are not conclusive. Marijuana affects fertility and pregnancy. So um, I think I have come to the end of, the, of my presentation and I uh, want to, you know, I guess I'm open for discussions. And um, thank you so much for, you know, sticking through me through that one whole hour. Um, I, I appreciate everybody's attention and, and presence during this webinar. Thank you so much, Giselle. That was a really thank terrific you. presentation. We do have thank a number you. of questions that have come in. Excellent. Excellent. So we, uh -huh. and we have some time, so we're ready. Um, can you elaborate a little more on the various cannabis plants? Sure, Amy. I think it's important. Um, and I like that question as a matter of fact, because I know in the PowerPoint we talked about cannabis sativa. And cannabis sativa is, is well known with, you know, it has a TAC not too high compared to cannabis indica. So this is what we call um, a day drug. It's an uplifting euphoria, increases energy. Um, it's like pretty much having a dream before you go to work or I don't know, you know, to get you going. You know, right? It's, it's, it's um, the day drug. And then cannabis indica is your stronger one. This is the one that you use before you go to sleep. Uh, it's relaxing. Uh, it gets the body high. It's also being used for medical marijuana. It's a body buzz. Um, and again, this has approximately 25 to 60 percent of THC. Um, again, a person might use, you know, smoke a blunt before they go to sleep for their aches and pains. Um, and then the next um, plan is cannabis rudellaris. Uh, is traditionally used in Russia and Magnolia for folk medicine, specifically for use of treating in depression. Uh, Uralis is among the lowest TAC producing plant and is really, really used for recreational use. So I hope that answered that question. I, I think that was very extensive. Thank you. Um, how harmful would you say K2 spice is? Well, K2 spice is very, very dangerous. They can create life threatening effects, including brain swelling, paranoia, uh, heart palpitation, chest pain, severe bleedings. And if someone you know that has used a synthetic cannabinoid or a K2 spice, they need to get help right away. And you know, the following steps would be to really call 911 for, for immediately. Uh, if someone stops, especially they're breathing, 
stops breathing or collapses or has a seizures, these symptoms can be life threatening and require medical attention. I will also call the poison control center and your physician, if you have your own physician, because um, it's a scary drug. It's a scary drug, and a lot of people don't know the side effects of K2 spice. And um, they, they're pretty potent and dangerous. Thank you. Um, are medical marijuana dispensaries open now during uh, our social distancing? Uh, yes, when I did the research, I, yes, they are open for individuals that might need to acquire medical marijuana. Yes, they are open. And uh, for more information on that, you can go into um, have questions about COVID-19, uh, poison control. Uh, it's called Department of Health Division of Medical Marijuana. Great, thank you. Um, here's another one, or on, or here's one on CDB oil. Um, are you saying that C CBD oil can also cause the some of the effects that marijuana causes? No, because CBD oils are supposed to be, be supposed to have less uh, THC. So it should be in order to be sold and is uh, safe supposedly and i say supposedly because it's not fda approved it should only be up to 0.3 percent uh, but if it's higher than that then then you're not getting the right uh you know the right use of the cbd i see um thank you um oh, thank you. This, this, I, this question i'm not sure um is the lack of regulation based on Date. I'm not quite sure what um, is meant by that question, but just to clarify, each state has their own regulations relating to marijuana. Yeah, and I, let me just say something about that too. Um, as you know, New Jersey is not legalized, and, and the reason for that is because we have a lot of our coalitions and our, our people working in the prevention side, not wanting to, you know, passing an ordinance banning this legalization, because the reality is marijuana is a, is a class one controlled substance and federally it's illegal. In order to learn more about the benefits of marijuana or even the health related to medicinal marijuana, that drug has to be lowered to a, a, a substance control tool so in order to do that kind of research. And we don't have, and it's not, it's not happening. And it continues to be a class one control substance. Therefore, we don't really know, we don't have another research on on the use of, of both the benefits of using marijuana as well as the risk associated with medical marijuana. So, mm -hmm. and that kind of leads into the next question where the, um, our, our attendee mm -hmm. is asking, are the side effects of medical CBD comparable to other medications used for the same purpose? So are there, there are side effects associated with using um, medical marijuana? Uh, yes, especially if you're smoking it. Again, if you're smoking something, you're gonna, you know, uh, you know, you, we've seen that from Colorado and um, in California, they do doing poor policing. They, you know, they're using pesticides, they're using, you know, other stuff to treat these plants and then they're giving it out to the public. So yes, there is, there can be some health uh, effects. So it's very hard to tell uh, if, you know, the help, because in some individuals, like I know that I use, let's say CBD um, butter to put in, you know, top of a, a cookie to spread it and then they eat it they ingest it and it helps with their thyroid sy uh, uh, syndrome so again it's just more when you smoke something and then i always try to get that point across to young people because they think smoking marijuana is okay or uh, smoking the, the the medical marijuana nothing nothing comes good from smoking everybody knows that you go to your doctor nobody's going to tell you hey go ahead and smoke your medicine you know no we know it's going to be harmful so that's one thing from the get-go you tell people that you, know, you can't smoke no smoking your meds so, and that that would you know, be the problem. same would would you would you say the same thing if somebody was microdosing and using a small amount of um natural herb uh, through a water bong would you say that that's the same the same issue with the smoking as a problem 
well, whatever you smoke in, you're impacting your lungs and your other organ, you know, body, other body organs. Um, again, you know, nothing that you smoke is is good for you. Um, yeah, I mean, would yeah. Um, so in in that vein, um, do you uh, feel like um, people who smoke marijuana um, are more at risk during COVID nineteen? Absolutely, absolutely. Because again, if you're smoking, it's you a greater risk of, um, you know, having bronchitis, you develop more cough and phlegm production. Um, and again, you're sharing the blunt with somebody, you know, or you're sharing your pipe, you're sharing your bomb, that shouldn't be happening. Because again, it put you at risk of, um, you know, of contracting the COVID-19 from somebody or you giving it to somebody. So yes, it's very high risky behavior doing those kind of things at this time. So if someone is smoking marijuana to help cope with the anxiety and stress of COVID-19, what would you recommend that they do? The reality is that people are using substances at this time. Unfortunately, that's that's the truth. People are smoking, they're drinking. Um, obviously, you know, you don't tell people what to do, right? But you at least uh, can tell them they can, you know, do something else. Uh, right now, they have a lot of virtual meetings online that people can tap into to help with that stress. Um, they could have a hot tea, a nice hot shower, you know, so giving them other alternatives that they can use. Um, and also, you know, by you giving them this information, you let them know the, the, the harmful effects of smoking marijuana during this time, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah, but that's, it's, that's reality. This is what's happening. Uh, people, I am self-medicating and this can make their emotional symptoms even worse, right? Um, if, you know, they can do something else. We actually had the perinatal addiction prevention project. We actually uh, just developed two videos regarding, you know, breathing techniques, how to help an individual relax during this time. So I invite all of you to look into our YouTube channels and, and take those videos in English and Spanish. Yeah, and those are great, great videos. Uh, I know the team did a good job on those. So we have a question about how bad uh, it is um, how bad is smoking marijuana compared to smoking tobacco cigarettes? Okay, so we do know that one tobacco, according to the CDC control of 2016, one, one cigarette has 7,000 contaminants. However, remember we talked about uh, that one joint that has more carcinogens because again, you're breathing in deeper and it stays longer in your body. You might not be having all the you know, 7,000 carcinogens, but you are also um, getting, again, think about the pesticide, the fungus, and all the stuff that comes in the in the marijuana products. So I don't wanna say it's better or less, but it's obviously, um, it's, they're both harmful with the same, uh, with the same equality. And um, we know it's, it has more cancer causing. And because of the marijuana today, the indica is much more potent and, and, and dangerous to use during this mm -hmm. time. And that's the money one of today. Yeah, that's the money one of today. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on the use of medical marijuana for opioid use disorder? Uh, well, it's, it's part of, um, uh, it has been added for the governors. Um, Governor Murphy has added it as a, as a, as a way to treat the substance use. Uh, opioid condition, con uh, the substance op uh, opioids, uh, substance use disorder as a condition because again, it helps with the with the pain, uh, but that has to be really, um, I guess, you know, in an individual case, it should be taken into consideration with the physician and patient, and again, um, a lot of close uh, supervision when it comes to that. Um, because other things can also help manage pain, right? Uh, you know, iPads, uh, you know, relaxation, uh, taking other things. So, you know, I guess instead of an individual uh, be giving strong medications such as opiates, especially for uh, the elderly, right? That they sometimes they give them a lot of pain medication, and they maybe could could become a good candidate for that. Um, again, the only danger is with the young people is that uh, the risk of developing that addiction if not used properly. 
Well, so given the negative effects of marijuana, do you think we will see an increase in marijuana use disorders in Canada since it's legalized for the entire country? Well, we've seen, we seen it uh, from the studies that I just shared with you guys um, in California and in Colorado, and not to go far, even here in New Jersey. I did say there's about 7,000 New Jerseyans using can uh, marijuana, so medicinal marijuana, I should say. Um, you know, so that we're trying to prevent the legalization because, again, we don't want the young people to start early. We, you, you guys, uh, heard me reviewing the statistics on the driving, how it increases uh, car accidents. So, you know, you know, you know, so far as far as I know, in New Jersey, we are very strong uh, with all the prevention coalitions uh, banning that the legalization of recreational use, not the medicinal one. Where uh, marijuana is legal, are companies uh, responsible for listing the amount of THC in the product? Uh, they, they, that, that would be nice. It's the same thing with um, electronic cigarettes. They, it should be listing them. But unfortunately, I, I don't see, you know, some of them do, but not all of them. But I have seen um, uh, some dispensaries uh, where they do list the milligrams. But again, you know, if you don't know how much is too much, and uh, then that can be an issue. Mm -hmm. But some of them do, some of them don't, depending, I guess, um, the dispensaries that you go. But they do, they're supposed to list um, the grams. Um, I don't think they list the side effects. I don't think they do that. Does legalization eliminate the illegal sales of marijuana? Does the legalization eliminates the sales of marijuana? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't. The illegal sales. Oh, so no, 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 no. I don't think so. I don't think so. On the contrary, you know, it's, I don't think so. Um, again, you know, maybe they, if, let's say, they legalize it for recreational use and they put a price, people might not have that kind of price to pay for a blunt, you know, whatever they're using. They, they still, there's always going to be somebody uh, trying to compete with the legalization, you know, with, with, the, with the regular price. And, then, you know, you're going to find it in your black market, in your dark web, that people can have access to this. So no, I don't think it's it's gonna make any difference to me for me. I think I don't I don't think so. Okay. Um, you can always get it cheaper. Are there, are there resources available that can help consumers um, decide or, or get more information about CBD products that are tested or might be safer for use? Sure. Um, like I say, if you visit the Department of Health, the Division of, of Medical Marijuana, they is pretty much as places. They have lots of information there as a resource for you. Great. I think that's that's terrific. Um, I have we've we've have a lot of questions here, so I'm apologize that we're we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Okay. So I think this is um, I, this is an interesting question to end on. Um, how can we gear information to adolescents and young adults so they can take the information seriously with regard to how marijuana may impact their brain development and long-term impact as adults? Mm, nice question. Um, what I can say is that this nice resources made by Sancha for um, parents, you know, for parents to obtain information about um, the, you know, the facts about marijuana. Uh, you have partners of Drug Free New Jersey also available, and they provide education for teachers and for parents. Um, we have a lot of nice resources, even the perinatal addictions. You know, if anybody wanted to learn more about uh, the CBD oils, the edibles, we have brochures that we can actually give out and it's free for like our clinics, uh, our hospital settings that you can learn more about, you know, the, the, the CBD oils uh, and what it does to the body uh, and also, you know, to the, the body and mind. So we have resources. There's definitely lots of resources. Please tap into SAMHSA and uh, Partners Drug Free from, of New Jersey. Partners Thank for you. Drug Free New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Giselle. This is um, very useful. Perhaps um, we could put together a, a list of some of these resources and we can send that out to the people who are on the call. 
um, because I'm sure they would be interested in them. I also want I also want to mention that we will be doing um, a perinatal addictions um, webinar series in June. Um, and the topics that we will be covering are the impact of alcohol. We have one webinar on vaping and our third uh, webinar will be uh, Dr. Kev Kevin Sabat uh, spending two hours talking about marijuana. So I hope that those of you, and I know a lot of you, there's a lot of you on the call and you're very engaged. I hope you will join us for um, that webinar on June. 17th and um, hopefully have more time for to answer questions. Um, I want to thank Giselle Alawi again for an excellent presentation and doing a great job answering these questions. Also, oh, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining in. That's wonderful that there's a lot of interest on this topic and it should be yes, because we right. need to during this time we need to try to get a lot of education out um, talking about marijuana and uh, vaping to the students, to your patients, to everyone about the dangers of it. So I'm glad Absolutely. a lot of people joined. Thank you yes, so much, everyone. And, and just if, I could be a service, if I could be a service to anyone, please just reach out to me. Do you want to give your email address? Oh, sure. It's uh, Ylawi, A L A O U I, and then at partnershipmch.org. Thank you so much. And I just want to shout out to Laura Hall, who's been handling the technical back end of our program. And again, to everybody here today. Just a reminder, Thank you, Amy. in case you missed the beginning of uh, the webinar, in about an hour, you'll receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Um, please complete that. Your certificate of completion will be sent via the email that you provide on that evaluation. So please be sure that you type the email address um, correctly without any typos so we don't have problems getting you your certificate. And you will receive your certificate within one week of today. A calendar of all of the partnerships upcoming virtual programs can be found on our website www.partnershipmch.org under the Professional Education Virtual Programs and Resources tab. We've got a great series coming up in May on perinatal mental health, and then again, the perinatal addictions series coming up in June. We also offer on-demand recordings of many of our programs, and they're listed on the website as well. Hope you can join us at our next educational event. Have a good day. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.